Welcome to RFG Exchange. Containers are hot topics these days as developers race to leverage the technology, whose promise is to speed deployment by integrating core reusable components within deployment packaging. Vendor executives from Canonical, Cisco, Google, IBM, Red Hat, and VMware all sat with us to discuss two types of containers. And the question is, what are the advantages of and what motivates the affinity towards container adoptions? We'll talk about the tendency to use lift and shift lightweight VM model versus developer preferences and challenges of implementing application process containers. Here's some of that insight coming up right now on the rounds. Let's get started. A container is, let's say, an isolated operating system process, right? Isolated in terms of uh, compute power and isolated in terms of uh, possible threats or possible influences from uh, noisy neighbors or other other workloads sharing the same sharing the same environment. Right? Machine containers, it's often a, a good first step into the container world, particularly with legacy applications, uh, traditional applications, applications that have not been refactored into. Mm -hmm. Uh, that process container, that microservices type architecture. You said lift and shift, and that's exactly what we see. We see running workloads, existing workloads that are able to be moved directly into a LexD container and take advantage of the benefits of, uh, of containers, the density profile, the low latency profile, uh, the performance, the raw performance. So if you look at containers and you look at them as VM, the same premises might apply. So you can say, oh, I'm going to code the same way you put inside a container. Well, some people are asking that. There are two reasons. One is more financial, another even regulated. There are people that say, oh, can I leverage the lifecycle management tools and trainings and processes that I already have in place for VMs and somehow adapt them to containers? They are lightweight, they are faster, they are more agile, but I don't want to actually step up on the learning curve that fast. I want to leverage some of my investment before. That one aspect of it. The other one has to do with, I, m I need to run a particular code on a particular app inside the container, but I need that code to be eventually patched because it's regulated. But containers got hot because it was really about you know, developer affinity, right? And understanding what developers need and, and, and providing a simple way to deploy, manage code, run code in multiple different locations or clouds, et cetera. Now, when you take all of that, what we've seen over the last 12, 18 months is the vendors in the container ecosystem have realized that, you know what, we need to focus on container cluster scheduling, container runtime, container management, and really adding value from the container up the stack. But then going down the stack is an area where VMware has often excelled and continues to excel. So things like programmatic networking or programmatic security, programmatic storage, machine isolation, these are not necessarily things that a company like Docker or Pivotal wants to spend a ton of time on. You have to pick your battles. So what we're seeing in this space is this maturity where you see this PaaS layer where the container vendors are mainly focused, and then below that, this IaaS or infrastructure as code layer is where VMware is continuing that value. Now for us to make all of this work, what we're doing is we're making sure that we natively support container APIs, open source APIs above our stack, so that the, the uh, integration point is at the container API, which means if we get to that point where you want to run containers on metal, we say, go ahead. Right? You're using a native container API set for access, and that puts the pressure on VMware for our part of the space to win on merit. If we don't, customers are free to go. You ask about the different types of containers, and I would you know, think about two major types. The one that are the application-like containers in which Docker is the main representative of, uh, those are the lighter weight and you know more recent ones. And then there is what we often are called machine containers, mm -hmm. like the LXD uh, type of containers. Um, difference being that the Docker containers are more um, smaller, immutable. They will not be changed. Uh, if you want to do an update, you just kill, reset, yeah. and start a new one. Well, the LXD container is a more traditional VM-like. Uh, you will update it, it will be longer lived, and you will have some of the features of management that are associated with virtual machines. So you are able to do a lot of the management in that uh, area. Kubernetes is a container orchestrator that really gives uh, application ops and cluster ops individuals the ability to scale out 
their mm -hmm. containers and applications um, and not have to worry about any type of infrastructure issues that could happen. So really you're abstracting away the infrastructure and creating this logical layer that enables you to manage and deploy your applications. Any process that can run in a Linux machine uh, can run in a in, a, in an isolated container, right? so technically speaking, it is possible. Now, there are applications that were developed uh, to use uh, intrinsic uh, resources from, from the operating system where it's running. For example, to use a specific network uh, libraries, to use a specific operating system uh, libraries. And uh, even though that is possible to run them on containers, the packaging of that application is going to involve more uh, more effort to the point that you realize if it's if there is there is really value in doing that at this moment let's say uh, but for other applications that uh, let's say most of or the workloads that we see there like the Java applications that we see running enterprise um, uh, or .NET applications that we see running enterprises there are actually workloads that could be very easily very easily um, transformed and let's say repackage uh, into a Container-based uh, model. I think that that container technology has evolved uh, alongside VMs in many cases, with the with with a few exceptions. Uh, containers themselves have been around for nearly as long as as virtual machines, and I think they've matured uh, just as well and just as quickly with a lot of the same technology that's baked into the Linux kernel. For Linux on Linux workloads, there's no faster, more performant performant way of running those workloads than than containers. VMs just mm -hmm. simply can't match the performance characteristics of containers. Talk with the customers, they understand that containers or process containers or stateless containers, what they are meant to do. They understand that in order to build a new application that use them, they used to have a framework that more microservices based, the 12 factor comes in. Mm -hmm. All how you build those apps that are predicated to use that particular environment in those premises, everything needs to be an API code of bodies of two all that new approach that has way to go to mature and adoption across the, the world, a lot of people don't have the skills yet. So they're not all the teams have been trained and don't have enough people with at massive scale with that knowledge or that experience. If we think about the intersection between VMware and containers, containers play provide great code portability and container level uh, orchestration and optimization. Right? There's management that lives at that space. VMware below containers provides programmatic compute network storage and security that integrates with containers using native container APIs. So primarily, I believe the portability is the greatest uh, value. So you're able to deploy the same container because it comes together with everything it needs in whatever environment you need to, and that is a very valuable proposition. You also have the benefit of the lighter weight that provides for more density. So you're able to deploy more and more con uh, content in a lighter weight environment um, in a consistent manner. Therefore, you know, because they require fewer resources, they reduce your need uh, for resources and therefore it could be less expensive. For Red Hat, I truly believe containers are safe and secure to run your enterprise and your mission critical workloads. Right? And I can give you one example of that. We have a, a product uh, called OpenShift, which we run on AWS. Because the fact of the matter is that developers are writing applications and deploying those applications into, into containers of all of these types that we've discussed, and they're making their way into production. And it, I think it's, it would be, uh, we can talk about whether they're ready for, for production or not. I think that's missing the point. The fact is that, is that they are in production and we need to treat them as such. This container usage dichotomy could result in political differences, but in reality, executives should plan on implementing both container types over time. Because of this, the lift and shift capability and the ability to use VM tools makes the migration machine containers a logical first step. However, if one hopes to take full advantage of the full set of container capabilities, organizations will need to build the skill base so that they can effectively use the DevOps rapid development model and roll out applications using process containers. Stay tuned for actionable insight with top vendor and practitioner executives you won't find anywhere else. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and on our website at rfgex.com to be amongst the first to know.